Welcome to Business Unveiled Podcast. This is the place where we help overwhelmed, time-starved entrepreneurs like you make the profitable shifts to get more done and get more out of life. I'm your host, Angela Prophet, award-winning eight-figure entrepreneur and CEO. And in every episode of Business Unveiled, I'm bringing you conversations that will give you the expertise and strategies that will scale your team and business so you can get shit done. That's GSD in our world. So get your time back and grow a business that helps you be present in your life. Let's do this, y'all. I'm back for another episode of Business Unveiled, and today we are on site in Italy, right outside of Rome, and my guest is going to tell you all about where we are. Hello, and welcome to my kitchen. <laughs> and what we're doing here. Oh, this was the best. This is See, this is what you can never prepare for. So Dolly's concert was on Friday night. I'm so excited to interview him. No more, no knife? Yeah, for the knife touch. Okay. And we'll hear his side of the story. And it's my friend Rita and Massimo's. If you will see, it says Rita and Massimo's home. She is hidden away from us. And because she is not very well, she usually makes all the most amazing food. And today I'm going to, but I'm going to <laughs> I mean, impart some of the wisdom that I have learned from Rita after coming to Italy and getting to know Rita and Massimo. They grow their own olives and they make their own olive oil. And I learned the difference between really good olive oil and not so good olive oil. And I also learned that really good olive oil can change a salad. And I mean, you can literally like with lettuce, she just pours like a ton of olive oil on everything and then puts some salt on it and it's delicious. So, I mean, it's crazy what the difference. It's so different than the United States. <laughs> Yeah. Rita taught me that there's good olive oil and not good olive oil. Introduce yourself and tell us what you do. My name is Brian Worley and I produce and design events in the States, in the US of A. And now I'm a culinary expert, an Italian culinary expert. Just kidding. Um, but I am making dinner for Angela and I which is only fitting as we do this podcast in Italy and get to taste the amazing food. Not a good cook, but I do know how to cut and I do know how to throw olive oil on things. And trust me, in Italy, they do that and it tastes so good. And I don't know how to do any of that, so it's very fitting. Yes. My favorite thing about Italy or just pretty much being in Europe in general, they put olive oil on everything and now I have definitely grown to love olive oil, good olive oil, you have to have good olive oil. Um, the other thing is that you just put some salt on everything and everything's so fresh, it tastes so good. And then prosciutto, I just love prosciutto. And bread, They make we put everything on bread here. And mozzarella, so excited. Mozzarella or burrata are all the good yummy things. I'm not a very, I always cut tomatoes weird, I think. I just kind of like cut the bad part out right there in the middle. Just cut around it. And then you have some small pieces and then some big pieces. Do you, we eat that much tomato? That's a lot of tomato, but yeah, we'll eat it. Should I cut one more or do you think that we can cut No, I more? think that's enough. Okay. Okay. This is literally what, what Rita does. This is, this is like cooking with Rita. What would Rita do if she was cooking? Literally, she just pours like tons of olive oil on everything. So I'll probably put some too much on there. We have tomatoes, salad. Look like salad. Now we have to cut up the avocado. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you get into events? Give us like a quick lifeline journey from when you were born till now. Oh gosh. In 30 seconds. Born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Moved to Colorado because my dad was in the military. Moved to Austin, Texas when I was 12. Consider myself a Texan. Uh, love Austin, love Texan, or Texas. My dog's name was Tex. Moved to Los Angeles my senior year of college to do my internship. Lived in LA for 22 years. Fell into events, just like by chance. And for over two decades, I have been producing and designing events, which means that I have a lot of knowledge and skill in this area. And life experience. And life experience. <laughs> because if I say I'm old, Angela will get mad at me, so I say that I'm experienced. I don't get mad. I just think that it makes people sound old fogey-ish as if like 
they're not good enough to like fit in with young trendy people and like Instead, I just want people to reframe. Wow, that how beautiful looks so is that? Good. Oh my god, I'm so hungry. <sighs> Who does not live? Fresh mozzarella. Oh my god. Okay. People who you know are in, above forty, they have more life experience. Oh. Even if you haven't been producing events for two decades, like you still have a lot of life experience, and a lot of what events is about is about understanding what people want and how to manage expectations oh, you've been a television host i have so i moved to la i fell into events found out that that was a career um i was social chairman for my fraternity but um that doesn't necessarily i i always say that i when i moved to la i used to joke and i would say that i was social chairman for my fraternity but then i was um hollywood social chairman <laughs> <laughs> when I was throwing parties in Hollywood, it was kind of fun. So I was like, I'm Hollywood social chairman. Um, I love that. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I was young. So I went from college to straight to L.A. because I went to school in Texas. And then when I moved to L.A. and I started doing events, I said, I am Hollywood social chairman. I thought that was kind of fitting. Very fitting. So then I started doing events in L.A., which was amazing because I mostly did entertainment uh, related events, which was so much fun because I did like probably one of the first coolest, biggest events that I felt like I had arrived was when I got to be involved in designing the first two Harry Potter premiere <gasps> parties. <gasps> Asha and Amanda, Harry Potter? Yes. Oh! <gasps> Do you have a Harry Potter wand? Me? Yeah. No, why would I? Because you're the party planner and you just take that little wand and go expiliantus or whatever the word I is. I think it's bibbidi bobbidi boo. That's a different show. Yeah, but That no. is not Harry Potter. Anyway, so I got, it was cool because when, I mean, this was back along, you know, back in the day when movie premieres were really big. So it was really cool because I used to get like a private screening on the studio lot. I would go into this private theater say on the Paramount lot or the Sony lot or one of the different studios. And then I would just sit there and watch the movie all by myself. And I would take notes before the movie even came out. And then I would get to take the what I learned or say there was an event in the movie. And then I would try to recreate that. So I did the Cat in the Hat and Sea Biscuit premiere. So I got to see the movie. And then I got to go to this warehouse in Burbank, which was like this huge giant warehouse. And they had all the props from Cat in the Hat. And I got to pick out what I wanted to use in the party and figure out how I was going to use it, which was actually really cool. Yeah, it was so, so awesome. It was so much fun. And eventually, I ended up designing the red carpet for the Emmys. Um, I did 27 American Idol parties the last nine seasons of it when it was on Fox. So did you know Kelly Pickler? I mean, I know who she is, but she I... She was on one of the... First American yeah, Idols. I did the last nine seasons. I think she. I think she was on. She's American like season Idol. two. Yeah, I think she was way before I started. Okay. Doing American Idol stuff. Jordan Sparks. I actually know Jordan Sparks. So she. So Kyle Kelly's husband writes for her. So I actually know Jordan Sparks because then I started. This is a pretty kind of a funny story. So then I started hosting TV shows, and when I was hosting the TV shows, I got asked. I don't play golf. But I got asked to play in a celebrity golf tournament in Hilton Head. I was kind of like, uh, I'm not really a celebrity, but they paid for me to go to Hilton Head. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even I swing a club. Yeah. I ended up not even playing golf. She was there, and and we hung out the whole time. So it was it kind was of so fun. fun. So what would you tell someone who's watching or listening that even though you're in the public eye and you're a celebrity? They're just people too. So just a person. For someone who is striving to work with people in entertainment or do events for people in the public eye, like what is your top takeaway or your top tip or your top like learning lesson where you're like, wow, I wish that someone told me that when I was younger, not in age, but younger in your business, working with people in the public eye and entertainment. What, what's the top thing you would tell them? From my experience, what I would tell anyone starting in the business is that you can never say no. You always say yes to everything and it's not glamorous. I think people think that what we do in, in the events are glamorous. It's very far from glamorous, but you just kind of have to do anything and everything you can to meet people. Never burn a bridge, which is very important. Be polite to everyone. And yeah, so anyone that works with me, 
I never ask anyone to do anything that I won't do. Exactly. So I will get up on a ladder. I will hang drape. I will organize flowers. And then I always come back and I help strike too because I think that it's important that we all work as a team. Now, not that that is normal. It is normal in the very beginning when you're first starting. I still do it. But that's not always the best use of your time. Ah. This is yeah. when you outsource. It, it, it's not the best use of my time, but it also is, <laughs> here's what I say. I may not be able to do that every time because I'm yes. running the show. Exactly. But I also like to get things done. And when I'm on site, I am, idle hands make idle work. And so the more people that are jumping in and getting things done, the more things we get done, the faster we get out of there and everyone's happier. And I get it done the way I want it. As you have grown your brand and your name and your reputation over the years, things happen and things come up and you have to pivot with your time based on your goals. And so I'd love for you to share a little bit about how, from where you started, from where you are today, and how you have really started to manage your time differently. Because my whole thing is like, Yes, I mean, I like to be at all of the events, but you have to, when you have a team, you have to divide and conquer. And you cannot do this alone. You have to have a team. You cannot do it alone. Tell them how many events you just did before coming in. Where do we start? Okay, do you like this kind of bread? Oh my God, that's Or huge. this kind of bread? I don't know. What's the difference? Well, this one's more like... Like is one sourdough or one's... This one's more... Which one's softer? Feel. This one's pretty soft. Okay. And this one's soft also. My hands are clean. Are we, <laughs> we have to choose one and cut one, right? I'm just asking if you prefer one over the other. Um, I think I like the way this one looks. It's a little bit more interesting. Okay. I don't think it's in the beginning. I think it's a, man, it's a matter of managing your time and expectations, but it's also getting things done. But in the beginning, whenever I started, I did exactly what you just said. I said yes to everything. Oh. And I'm not saying that I would still do that. I think that in my experience of like doing a lot of different things, I found my path of saying, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, to this day, I still say, why, why am I doing this? I hate my job. I hate my job. But, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, then I'm like, oh, I love what I do. Right. But I definitely am always like, Oy! Can like, you just do that again with the knife up? Oy! I mean, like, okay, so a few weeks ago I was doing a wedding out at the Ritz at Lake Oconee, uh -huh. which is roughly an hour and 15 minutes from Atlanta. So I get out there, I take the linens with me. For some reason I just had this thought. I was like, Take the linens with you, drop the linens, and also bring the flatware. So I bring the flatware, I bring the linens, drop those, getting ready, waiting for the truck to come with all the furniture, all the flowers, all the decor. I get a call that the truck blows a tire. Like literally they send me a picture of the tire and it looks like gravel. And they're 30 minutes away from the venue and you just have to keep calm. And everyone was like, you're so calm. And I, I kept saying, well, what can I do? What can I do? Literally, the truck got the tire changed. They got to the venue. We had 90 minutes to load in an entire wedding. Holy cow. No, we, I mean, I felt like He-Man. I was like taking back bars and I was carrying them in. It, it, I was sweating. It was raining. It was freezing cold. And I kept saying, I hate what I do. I hate what I do. I hate what I do. <laughs> Why do I do this? Why do I do this? But it ended up being beautiful. We got it literally loaded in in 90 minutes and it was amazing. And how many people was this for? 110. Okay. So it was a good size. Yeah. I mean, it was 11 tables. You think that's enough bread? Well, do you want more? No. No. <laughs> it's a lot of bread. No, it's only four pieces, but no one wants the heel. You're right. It's three. No one wants the end. So I'm going to do one more. Right before I came to Europe, I did... Five events in eight days, one wedding, two corporate events, a bat mitzvah, and worked on a concert for Dolly Parton. 
And uh, how Which many was in different, a different city, cities is, and states and countries were you in? Well, th four in Atlanta and one in Austin. These are the kinds of things that you can never prepare for. The concert for Dolly was on Friday night. I had to set up for a bat mitzvah the next day, or that was on Saturday in Atlanta. So I strategically booked the very first flight out of Austin in the morning on Saturday morning. I get a text right before the concert. Your flight has been canceled at 6 a.m. So of course, I go into panic mode, but then I get a, they had rebooked me on a seven o'clock flight, which still put me in an hour later into getting into Atlanta. I get into Atlanta an hour later. We ended up getting it all done, as we do, but you know, those are the kinds of things that you have no control over. And that's where I just have to say, I have no control over this. You get it done when you get it done. So let's talk about relationships. Let's Wait, do say you like your bread toasted or? I, I mean, whatever you think. I, I don't know. Sure. This is, here's the problem when I try cooking is that I use every plate, every bowl known to man. We have no rhyme or reason, but this is going to be so good because no, I'm so freaking hungry. Let's talk about if your flight, like if you got stuck. Who would you call to like well, execute and do everything for you? So, I mean, I have the team. Right. And I literally texted Carlos and I said, Carlos, hey, my flight is going to be an hour late. These are all the things that need to get done. Uh -huh. Make sure this happens. I will be there as soon as I land and can get there. So, I mean, you just have to rely on people and you realize that people, people who need people, no, people are the ones that can help you and you have to rely on other people in order to get things done to gsd get shit done i know but i don't like to cuss well that's just my brand honey i know but you cuss i don't and i try <laughs> very hard to get angela to not cuss all the time because i say language oh yes he language. helps remind me but language you know. oh my god look at how much stuff is here are you ready yep how did we meet? How did we meet? Oh, gosh. Well, do you want the real story? Yes, I want you to tell them the real story. Okay, so <laughs> I found out that Angela and I were going to be involved in this group with um, our friend Monica Bali, who started uh, IEC. Uh, well, I didn't meet her, actually. So I was told that Angela was going to be one of the people involved in the IEC, which is the International Events certification that Monica Bali is putting together, who is a dear friend of mine. So she told me that, oh, it's going to be you and Bob Conti and Angela from the U.S. And I said, okay, well, I don't know this Angela girl. I, I, I actually, in all transparency, I did somehow receive her newsletter, but I unsubscribed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because you didn't find value in it because you don't read it or watch it? Because I was like, well, I don't even know who this is, but that was a long time ago. So I think you must have gotten my address off the engage like thing or whatever. Anyway, so moving on. So Monica says, Angela is going to be one of the people that are involved in the IEC with you and Bob. And I said, okay, well, I don't know her, but I am going to email her. Long story short, never heard from Angela. <laughs> so I meet her in Italy for the first time, and I'm thinking, I do not like this girl. I'm not going to like this girl. She can't even return my emails. I'm not going to like this girl. But I don't do email. I don't do emails. But anyway, I do Marco Polo. That's right. To make a long story short, I didn't like her, but I do like her now. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> so don't judge a book by the cover or the lack of emails. Or when you don't understand someone's process. Yes, I didn't understand your process. I still don't understand all your processes, and you've tried to explain them, and there's a lot of them, so that makes it even more difficult. But I You're do learning. think I'm learning, but I also do think that for me, being the young age of almost 50, like I'm old school and like to actually speak to people on the phone and respond and get in touch with someone as opposed to sending a video text message via Marco Polo that is five minutes long and that I have to sit there and listen to when I would rather just have an actual real conversation. But if someone is not available and they have a three day event back to back, 20 hour days, and you really needed answers and you really needed to speak to someone, 
isn't it better to Marco Polo and get answers rather than if someone's just like, I'm not available for three or four days? Yeah, but I wasn't in need of immediate answers. I was just reaching out to say, hey, we're going to be involved in this thing, but yeah. to start things off. So for yeah. me, like if you had three 20 hour days, trust me, I understand it. All yeah. you had to do is be like, hey, I got three 20 hour days. I'll hit you up on the fifth after I take a nap for the fourth. I'm going to find that email. Here, should I find it now? We knew that we were all getting together and I told Amanda that I would just meet you in person. We're really good at following up and following through and closing the loop on things. I mean, we're not perfect. Also during COVID, a lot of priorities and time like had to shift. Is but maybe you could talk to her on the fifth day or on the seventh day because God even had time when he rested on the seventh day. <laughs> I just don't like to, to talk to people. Anyway, I'm kidding. I was like, it's okay. all about priorities in living in the moment. And clearly I was not a priority. Well, I didn't know him yet. Well, anyway, we love each other now. If I can add value or help someone like do something like I will Marco Polo them. I'll make a loom video. Like I'll do a video of like, this is how you do something. Like if I have the information, but like, if I don't have the information, there's no sense in like getting on a call or a zoom with it. Cause I didn't, I knew nothing. It was impersonal. She, literally it was done. Anyway, that's how we met. <laughs> fast forward, never we, judge a book by its Fast color. forward to like literally we roomed together in Switzerland. <laughs> and I carried all of her very heavy suitcases. I did not ask him to. He's just a gentleman, okay? Which is Yeah, I'm from really the South. Sweet. My mom would kill me if I didn't. From the South. Like perfect example. My mom, we go to Europe. My mom was like, remember everything that you pack is what you have to carry with you. So pack light. Whose suitcase was bigger and did I end up carrying? My mom's. Tell me how you met Rita and explain what a fam trip is and us traveling. Cause I know a lot of people that listen and watch to the podcast, they're like, do you just travel around the world and like dance with people? And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I do now. <laughs> and, and that's because they're jealous. Five years ago, I dissolved my company with my business partner in Los Angeles and kind of was at this point in my life where I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And I had seen this movie called The Way with um, Charlie Sheen and Emilio Estevez, and it is about a 500-mile backpack trip across Spain. So I was invited on a fam trip to Italy. Tell them what a fam trip and is. And a fam trip is short for familiarity, and sometimes it becomes a family trip because you become so close to all the people that are on the trip with you. <laughs> like you sleep mm, together in the same room. Yes, with a divide between the bed. <laughs> and... Um, so I was invited on a fam trip to Italy and I thought, well, I have dissolved my company. I'm kind of at this break um, in my career trying to figure out what's next. So I was over in Italy and decided, okay, this is a great opportunity. I saw this movie probably eight or nine years before called The Way and it's about this backpack trip. And I thought, I'll go to the fam trip. I'm going to bring my mom um, because I could bring someone. So I thought it would be fun to have a little fun trip with my mom. And so I brought all my light, my suitcase with my suit and my nice clothes for the fam trip. And then I also brought my backpack. And so I left from the fam trip to, um, France and flew into Paris. And then I took the train down to St. Jean. And then I started my backpack trip, which was, took me 25 days to walk 500 miles. I started over the Pyrene Grand Pyrenee Mountains. Um, and then 500 miles and 25 days later, I ended up in San, uh, Santiago, which is the end of the pilgrimage. On the fam trip, um, I met Rita. <clears throat> and so the fam trip was at Rita's, um, where we are now, at El Tesoro. And it's a very charming agaturismo, which I guess we would closely translate to like a bed and breakfast farm to table um, in the US. And they have a 500 acre farm that grows olives and flour and all sorts of things. So Rita and I just became very good friends and Rita has become like a sister. Since September of 2020, I've been to Italy six times. So clearly I love Italy and this place is beautiful and it's the most amazing place to kind of get away. And they do yoga retreats here, they do cooking classes. They do retreats for artists, photographers, and painters, so they will come. So there's a lot to offer, and it's really charming, but it's also a great place for like a family reunion, just to get away. It's just kind of a little oasis. I mean, Il Tesoro means the treasure, so it is. It's a treasure. 
It is. It's so cute. But why yeah. is it important to get out of your business sometimes and work on the business and build relationships? And I think that building relationships is key in building your business because those relationships always lead to something else. And I think that as we grow in our careers, I mean, I started at one place where I was you know, I didn't know anything about events and now I've gotten to a place where I've hosted three TV shows and I've been flown as far as the Ukraine to speak to 400 wedding planners about how we do events in the United States. And through that growth process, every time you meet someone, those people lead you to learning more about the business, about what you do. And also, I think that as you grow, you also want to pivot in different directions. I can't imagine being 75 years old and still, you know, getting up on a ladder and schlepping flowers around and cleaning up at the end of a, an, an event. So I think that that's kind of how these relationships, as you grow in your business, the people that you meet kind of take you down the different paths that are going to lead you to the next job, the next pivot. I think especially after COVID, everyone, you know, they called it the COVID pivot. And I think that really helped a lot of people to figure out what was next in their career and think about how they wanted to either work smarter rather than harder, how they wanted to change the dynamic of what their job is and really just kind of focus on the things that are important and how you want to run your business. And I think that all these people that I meet, I, I think that every person, so going back to backpacking 500 miles on the Camino, I kind of didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't have a career strategy at the, at the time. My kind of joke was there's always a church on the Camino. That was my hashtag. And I thought that I was going to get to Santiago and I was going to have this aha moment where I was going to be like, aha, Ah, you know, because, you know, it is religious and there's churches and it's a lot about God. And I think that what I mostly came away with, and I tell people this all the time, is that after backpacking 500 miles, I realized that people come in and out of our lives for a reason. Everyone comes into my life for a reason. And it could be for five minutes to give me directions. It could be for two weeks and it could be for a lifetime. And so I think that that's where you learn from every person that comes into your life and they they have literally entered your life for a very specific reason and it could be like i said as simple as just giving you directions but those are the relationships that you have to build and you work on not the person that's giving you directions but just why people come into your life and and know that that person has just entered your life for a very specific reason. Um, Brian heard me talk about this psychology methodology that I absolutely love that we use for everything. Share your colors. Mine? Yes. Share your colors. What am I, orange? But he actually never did the numbers portion. And I did it with some people on the train in between one place in Switzerland and another place in Switzerland. So we finally did your numbers. And what are they? And what'd you learn from it? Well, so I think I'm an orange, right? We don't think. So I'm an orange, he's, but I was he's only- 20 orange. I was 20 orange, but I heard Angela talk about like the colors and you have to be, I only hire someone that's over a 20 in whatever color thing. You know? When you're trying to build a leadership yeah. team. But none of mine were, I mean, like I was right at 20 and then I had a 16, a 17 and a seven. So I was a little bit concerned that I'm not like a strong, solid, like over 20 candidate. Well, it, it's not about that. It's about different roles, a role in a business and in your work life. And then you, you know, some of us are moms and some are dads or we're an aunt or we're an uncle and we're a friend or a sister and a brother. And the idea is to find out about yourself first and how are you happiest operating? Because we all have all four colors. It's not that you're just a piece of shit if you're not in the mid 20s. Language. You want someone that's an expert at something, but then when you need people to join a team where you have a good leader, you need people that are a little bit more flexible across the numbers and the colors because when you have someone that's really amazing at something, they really suck at other things. I'm a 20 orange, mm -hmm. a very strong blue, and a very strong orange. He's very caring. And I have a low green, but I was very surprised because when I read the card in the description of a green, I felt like I very much connected to a green. So let's talk about that. So you that's shared true. with me earlier that you're you felt like your dad was green and you never wanted to feel introverted. And so there's some things that you did all based on that experience. So what can well, you Well, I definitely that? think my dad was an introvert and my dad, he's 
unfortunately passed away, but he moved to Hawaii. Our dads are partying in heaven. They're like, um, Go, Brian! Go, Ange! <laughs> Um, I can't imagine my dad ever getting that excited. My dad would. He was an introvert and moved to Hawaii, which is where he loved, and it was his favorite place. And, you know, as soon as he moved to Hawaii, his whole life, like, he had battled two different types of cancer, had to have a hip replacement, and he never got to enjoy his life. And he was a hermit and literally would just kind of hang out at his place in Hawaii. And I just know that that is something that I never want to be like. So I think that I try very hard to cope with coping mechanisms that will not make me, I guess, a true green, so that I will then become stronger in area, other areas. Listen, not th no color is wrong or bad. Not that green is bad. Not that no. color is bad or anything no, like know, that. It's but, not the, like but that. Like personality traits. Yeah. You, I see personality traits in all the different colors, mm -hmm. but you definitely realize that you do not, or that sounds really harsh, but yeah. that you see something maybe like I saw with my dad and his personality traits and his that the colors that he represented that don't necessarily align with the way that he lived his life and the way that I want to live my life. So I try very hard to be the opposite. And you became a really great dancer. Why? So uh, people think I'm crazy because they would never believe me when I say this, but like to walk into a party like a, where I don't know anyone or the first time it kind of makes me nervous and freaks me out a little bit and I get very like panicky which to hear him say this y'all we walk into a room and he goes one way and I go the other and like we meet a ton of people we work the room somehow all the oranges find each other and we end up on the dance floor like closing it down yes but I love to dance but that is my coping mechanism as that the way that I have learned to deal with I don't know if it's like a because it's never been diagnosed, but some kind of like social anxiety that I have is that rather than having to talk to people and have conversations, I love to dance. And so by dancing, I know that I can still be part of the group. I can still be active within the event or wherever I am, but I don't have to necessarily socialize because to me, I mean, I do like to make connections, and but I prefer to make a deeper connection with people. So it would be over dinner or over drinks or something more intimate than a big party where it's loud. And I always say there's nothing that I hate more than going to an event where I have to make bullshit small talk and be like, what do you do? Because it's so loud. Where are you from? Like, I don't care because I'm most likely not going to remember, but it's those times when I can make a... Yeah, well, I mean, it's not, but it's not even a party. It's like even going to a bar. No, like, I know. A bar is, I know. is like one of the worst places to me that you can mm -hmm. ever go. And unless that relationship is going to develop past that night, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter it's to me. It's noise. Yeah. yeah, it is. And it's then just it's, just, it's just having a conversation to have a conversation, which leads to nothing. And I would rather build a deeper conversation or uh a relationship, I guess, with someone outside of having to yell at them and 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 learn more about them. So, and then the next day, your throat hurts really bad because yeah. you've screamed so loud to talk to people. At least that's what happens to me, and yeah. I lose my voice. But really, what it comes down to is we're both orange blues, so we get along. I didn't know you were blue. I thought you were an orange gold. No. Oh. I'm orange, but gold's my, my oh. palest oh. color, yeah. When we were talking about this trip, we'd both been gone from our hometown for well over a month and traveling from one place to another place, and not just cities, different countries. And so when we were all planning this, he Fun said- Fun fact, Angela and I, ha we live four hours away from each other. We oh have, yeah. We have actually never, ever seen each other in the United States. We've seen each other in Mexico. Okay. We've seen each other in Barcelona and Spain. We've seen each other in Italy. Turkey? We've seen each other in Turkey and Switzerland. Yeah. yeah. So we have literally, we live four hours away from each other. And I think in less than a year. It's been since October. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So less in than less a than a year, we've seen each other in never the United States. <laughs> but in five different countries so fun fact but we're never there but that's a, a choice that both yeah. that we both make for whatever reason we love to travel and so like-minded people just naturally yeah. fall together and and get along and so when we were talking about this trip he said i'm going to do this and this and this and i was going to go to malta but i can't go to malta we have a corporate event and then just with all the craziness of healthcare stuff going on malta's like hard to get to 
um, and get into. And that's fine. Like, I respect it, whatever. There's always going to be the future, right? When we were talking about this and trying to coordinate a few things just to work out to where we could have a GSD day and I could come and see this place in Italy and and then it sucks that Rita got COVID, but hey, that's... Yeah, so very, bad. very, very, very upset about Yeah, it. she's very upset. We're upset too, but you know what? I'll be back in September because in September, well, hold on, we'll get there in a second. So we were talking about this trip, back to the story, and I, I'm like, cool, just... I think we like FaceTimed a few times. Like we really didn't plan any. Like Amanda was amazing at like planning like this whole month. I mean, it was like a 30 something page itinerary with like all these different places and plane rides and stuff. And she's like, well, when you and Brian, so I'm like, Brian and I, are, we'll talk. We'll mark a pull or call or FaceTime, whatever. We'll call. It just so happens that each time Brian calls me or FaceTimes me, I'm on my treadmill working and yeah. I'm not in a meeting or I'm not with someone. And so I actually have been able to answer. Which well, because she will send me a Marco Polo. Yes. I'll listen. I'll see that it's like five minutes long. And then I will listen to 10 seconds of it. And then I will just call her. Or you FaceTime. Or FaceTime. Yeah. Yeah, FaceTime. I like to see people's thing. faces. We like adventure. We like to have fun. And we don't have to ask a lot of questions because we know it will be fine. So we showed up yesterday. So I didn't have any confirmations of train tickets or anything. He's like, I'm getting these trains. I'm like, I'm going to get the hotel. You do this, you do this. And then we just show up, right? Yeah. I mean, it was no big deal. And I didn't know. I, I did ask the day before, like, what time? Like, you just don't ask a bunch of questions. You just know it'll be fine. So when we got to Milan, we you knew that we could, like, check our luggage at the train station. I'd never done that before. And then just spend the day in Milan. And he's like, I want to ride this bus. So there's the hop on, hop off bus that literally is a tour of the city. And it was sold out. It was sold out, supposedly, which to me is hard to believe because people hop on and they hop off. And I never it's also saw the bus. been like COVID and there's not a lot happening. You know, I mean, there was some tourists. I mean, but usually the lines are epic long. Crazy and long. And there were a few lines, but it wasn't bad. Anyway, the, the whole point of the story is. You can really tell what someone is, and especially when you travel with people, and this is where like families and friendships and relationships and things, like you either are going to make it or it's going to break because your personality, it's, it's just, it, it's, it's too different sometimes, and it's too much to overcome. We I, mean, I have a good friend who I know that when I'm traveling with her, she will find all the best places to go. She will organize every part of the trip. We will have the best time. I don't have to worry about anything. But if it's like with, it, with Angela, we had no idea where we were going. And we just set out and it was like, that's fine too. We'll get our steps. Yeah. We'll do some walking, get a little exercise. I've eaten a lot of Swiss chocolate. And... Uh, and it was fun. We had well, a good time. And then I ate a lot of French fries yesterday. This different story. Different story. But the whole point is like the goals. And, and if you have been listening or watching my podcast for a long time, I always talk about this methodology. The goals, like they plan everything. Everything is researched ahead of time. There is a plan and a timeline. And the, the really great thing about that is like when you show up, you know you have good dinner reservations at places. You know you have a great place to stay. Like when you think and you plan ahead... That's why with events, like we know we have to plan ahead and we have to do a timeline. The point is, it's not that you can't do it or you're not good at it. What makes you happiest and what makes you feel full? And yes, like if you own a business, we have to be gold. If you're a mom, you have to be gold. Things have to stay on schedule. You have to have a routine. But at the end of the day, what makes you the happiest? I mean, Angela did want to go eat and that was like what was going to make her happy. But I said, no, we have to go see the Duomo. And that was okay. We just ate McDonald's French fries. Mm. Anyway, any place around there wasn't going to just completely blow the socks off of me. We would rather have like walked around the city. Which we did. We saw a lot of the city. We, and we got a lot of fun content too. Yes. We made lots of fun memories. But the whole point is oranges are super flexible. Blues do care about either having a great experience with people or other people. What is really interesting, though, because you did it a lot yesterday, like, you love to learn, you love history, which is the green in you. We would Which was stop. my lowest number, but I felt like that was the one I resonated with reading almost the most. Because you felt like it was you, Yeah. but I would never think that you were, had, like, green traits unless, you know, I've spent a lot of time with you and around you, but, you know, You're you so like lucky. to know these things. 
I do. Where, like, I don't really have a lot of green in me. I don't really identify with it at all. I surround myself with people that are very green and I'm so thankful for them. I don't care about stopping and reading the signs or scanning the QR codes. Like, it's just not... Something that's, that's because for her, to it's more important to be capturing, capturing content and stuff like that. I want to absorb it. Yeah. So I, there's, to me, there's nothing better that I love going on a guided tour yeah. and having a tour guide that knows everything yes, I do. that I can ask questions because I want them to give me, and I, they'll give me information, but I want to even ask more and know everything. And that's <clears> a very green trait. I will say, even as an orange that everywhere we go, everywhere we've been, I took my mom to Italy on a trip that I spoke at years ago, I will always hire someone to, like a local, like tour, to take us around and like kind of be a tourist, but you get more of like the local experience than like what everybody else is getting. And so going back to what we were saying earlier about the relationships, that you go and you meet people and you learn but you keep in touch with these people that you mesh with. And oftentimes it does have a lot to do with personality. So the gold plans, the green does all the research. They do the budgets, they do the numbers. They know where all the best gas prices are. And it's not so much always about the money as it is the quality for the money. And then they ask a lot of questions to make sure there are no surprises. Golds and greens do not like a lot of surprises, especially if they've yeah. researched it. Now, oranges and blues, blues, as far as the surprises go, if it makes them feel warm and fuzzy, they're going to laugh, have a good I time. I prefer to surprise someone else than be surprised. I think that that's just party players. <laughs> like, we love, I love putting stuff together for people. I love shopping for people. I okay, love I have a question then. So, kinds of things. How do your, I like doing how do your, what, what are they, the, your, not your love languages, I guess your love languages. Yeah, they're how do those weave into your colors? Because for me, mm -hmm. I would think that those must overlap a little bit. The book is cute and it's like, it's a good reference point. Just like the back of the card said, like the orange is like to leave things flexible and just do it when the moment arrives. And if you have a gold orange, if the orange is supposed to plan dinner and you know, you pick me up and I'm like, where are we going? You were planning. You're like, well, what do you want to do? And there's no plan. That would annoy a gold highly. If a goal was like, I'll cook dinner. I'll do this. I'll do that. You can always count on a gold. They will always come through. And that makes them happy when they're accountable and they're able to do those things. In love languages, golds, like they're very practical. They're not ever probably going to roll out of bed and be like, I'm going to go plan a trip in Barbados and drop 10 grand today. Like, no, I mean, this is like very well thought through. And so their love language is just uh, things that make sense, things that are very practical. They're never gonna do like this cr crazy shit, like go buy a helicopter or rent an airplane to I go. I wish I could afford a helicopter. We all know, we've worked with a lot of people with who are extremely wealthy and money doesn't make you happy. Um, it's a tool and it can help you get to where you want to go. But at the end of the day, if you're not a genuine person, if you don't value relationships, if you're not looking to grow personally and professionally, then money doesn't make things better. Money can't save your life. But anyway, that's a whole different tangent. Blues, their love language is affection. So they would much rather... You know, the, the date night and movie night on the couch, snuggling and cuddling That's and like I'm a blue. I like that. rubbing and like just the quality time is important. Um, and I very much agree with you. Like if I can't have a meaningful conversation, I don't want to talk to you. Like I have enough friends. I know enough people. <laughs> this is what I said. However, right when you think that you just don't want any more people in your life because you're good. You, go, you go on a fam trip to Switzerland and you meet some amazing people. <laughs> yeah. Your life is just enhanced and changed and enriched and it's new culture and it's new energy and it's just wonderful. But like you said earlier, you have people that come in and out of your life at a very specific times for specific reasons. And if, if you lose touch with someone, like we all go through phases of our life. We have different life cycles and depending on where you are in your business and what's needed, people are going to come and go. The craziest thing, the craziest thing is we were at lunch yesterday in between trains and I had a luggage tag on one of my bags and one of the girls that we were with said, oh. I was there nine years ago. Uh, yeah, nine years we ago. We were, all three of us, 
which we were all traveling together yesterday. All, all of us. All at the same conference, and none of us met while we were there. Never. Nine years ago. And nine years later. In the Cayman Islands. Yeah. <laughs> Completely different country. Today. Which we would have, which we should have met then because right. it was another country. It wasn't the United but States. But we were, it's the same conference and there were probably 200 people there. Yeah, there was like 350. Oh, okay. It's still. It was big. Yeah. Okay. There are a lot of people. But also too, um, I was with someone. And so I was dating someone at that time. We were together. And so when you're with someone, it just changes not the conversation so much, but it just changes the dynamic of everything. So when you're alone, you're more free to just at free will go meet people. You have to entertain anybody or take care of anybody else or introduce them to, to anybody else. And so sometimes like I like going to the conferences by myself because I don't feel bogged down where I have to entertain someone. You know me, I'll go out and talk to anybody and I'll talk to the wall. I'm the complete opposite of I'll walk into the room and be like, hi, how are you? Not that I want to like BS talk, but all I'm going to try to get you to do is dance and that's it. That's what, that's what like, I'm... let's go do a video. We'll, we'll do a TikTok. We'll do an Instagram reel, but I'm getting you to be comfortable in front of the camera. So when it's time for you to talk about your business, you're going to be much more comfortable. So psychologically, there's a reason, but selfishly, I like to dance and I like to get steps and burn calories <laughs> so we can eat the good food at the events, but it's all about timing and, and that's okay. Like there's nothing wrong with that but i think a lot of people struggle especially if you are high blue what uh why is someone not talking to you or why aren't you hanging out anymore but you just have to ask a lot of self-reflection questions which what's the biggest thing that you learned about yourself after the backpack trip uh the biggest thing i learned after the backpack trip actually which is kind of funny is there's three groups that kind of do the backpack that are on the Camino. There's there's a group of like 20 year olds that are most of them have just graduated from college. They're kind of just doing this as their backpack trip across Europe. There's a very small. I was 44 when I did it, so there's a very small kind of 30s and 40s group because most of them have careers mm -hmm. and so they're working. And then there's a very large group of older people that either have just retired, they've lost someone, they're doing this as kind of their next chapter and so they were all very slow i'm a very fast walker um god he is and i've got really <laughs> short legs <laughs> and i realized that i'm a lot more fun than i thought i was because i didn't want to hang out with the old people there wasn't a lot of people my age doing it and all the 20 year olds thought i was really cool and wanted to drink beer with me so i think that <laughs> we have so much fun <laughs> i came out of it thinking well i'm a lot more fun than i thought i was if i'm 44 years old and all these 20 year olds want to hang out with me so that probably taught you that age is just a number age is just a number but i have been saying age is just a number for a very long time but i think that life experience is what drives you to say you can say age is just a number but it's the experience that comes with like you know if you're dating someone that's significantly younger or older and you say oh well i think it's the way that we justify dating them and by saying age is just a number but i think that in actuality the experience of that comes with age is what really determines like if this relationship will work or not mm -hmm. because you can find red flags and you always justify them, especially if you're in that honeymoon period or you really love someone or you think that you really love them. And then once you realize that age is just a number, that's a great thing. But the experiences that I had, because I was in a relationship with someone that was 16 years older than me and I kept saying, age is just a number, age is just a number. But then when we ended the relationship and I was in my I think 27, 26, 27, then I realized I am so glad and I look back on it and I'm so glad that I had my 30s and my 40s and all these times. And if I would have still been in that relationship with that, it, it just ages, age is a number, but life experience is the quantifier. Yeah. Earlier we were talking about being a perfectionist and if you're in hospitality, especially if you plan and design. Or and, you're a Virgo. Or you're a Virgo. I'm a Sagittarius. Let's talk about you being a perfectionist. And like, I learned with age that priorities, like sleep is more important than making sure that all of your stuff is cleaned up. It, it can wait. Like you can't make up your sleep. And th some of these things, like you don't really think about it and realize it and prioritize your time until you do get older in age because your priorities shift. So I know we're both perfectionists at certain things, but what would your mom say? 
uh, growing up, I think it's because of the Virgo thing, but my mom would always say, when you strive for perfection, you set yourself up for failure because nothing will ever be perfect. And that was my goal growing up was everything had to be perfect. And I think that, you know, like looking at, say it's colors, whatever it is, being a Virgo, like I read the description of what mm -hmm. a Virgo is and I definitely fall into that thing. But then if you really know me, people are like, are you sure that you're a Virgo? Because I'm a perfectionist when it comes to some things, but mm -hmm. I'm not a perfectionist when it comes to, I'm really a perfectionist when it comes to work. Yeah. So if someone is paying me for my services or paying me to do something, I am an absolute perfectionist. Mm -hmm. But my house and my car can look like a bomb exploded for three weeks and it doesn't matter. So I think I found my perfectionist tendencies and my OCDs things more in work than I did in my personal life. So those areas like my car always looks like a, a disaster area but Backers my job really and like at the end of the night when we're striking an event I love to make sure that all the cylinders and the vases are put back in their boxes perfectly and that everything there's nothing that gives me more joy mm. than packing a car like a what? car and making sure that I can fit all the puzzle pieces of the suitcases in and get everything to fit like there is nothing more joyful to me than knowing that satisfaction of sticking all those suitcases and bags and getting them to fit. It's one of my favorite things. I don't know if people do this to you, but you know, I'll walk into a new room or a new space. I actually walk into spaces as if I've never been there. I mean, we've done so many events at like Skirmahorn or the Country Music Hall of Fame, and I walk in a blank slate every time because everyone, at least our clients, they want something unique. We repurpose things, but they want something unique. Yeah. So I can walk into a room, and this is something I'm really good at, and I just I just can look at it and know what fits. I I can yeah. I, I think that that's like I say that to people that's my superpower. Me too. And when I walk into a, a venue, yep, like that, I can be like, this is yep. what I see. I can spatially know yep. how many tables, and I love it when you walk into it, and they're like, we can fit 300 people in here. I'm like, there is no way with the dance floor, a stage, lounge furniture, everything that you want, you cannot fit. Even half that amount, but like I can literally you just, just know. I just know, and I, and so all the time people are like, "This is never going to fit. This isn't going to work. This is never going to fit." And I will say, oh, sometimes it is a tad bit unrealistic what we try to fit into a room. When I'm like, "We can make it fit. We'll find a place. It's okay." And then the catering team is like literally cussing me out. Because when I was in college, my mom even says now to this day that she was so concerned about me being clinically needed to be diagnosed with OCD. Because I would tell her, I won't go to bed until like everything is in place. Like everything had to be perfect. And I was so OCD about cleanliness and germs and just everything had to have a place. But that was also, I think, by me being raised by two gold parents. But I'm still very, like, neat. I like things to have a place, and I like things to be organized. However, priorities. Even with events, sometimes my team wants to just strangle me. At the end of the night, you know, I want to do a rap meeting, and then I want all the radios turned off. I want all the cords individually wrapped. I want the little earpieces, like, completely wiped off. Like, all these things need to happen. Instead of waiting until we get them back out, I just can't stand to throw everything together. Even when we get all the linens and all the stuff comes in, my mom says that I used to line everything Thing up as a child even before I could talk and if someone touched my line I would like come out of my skin I'm still kind of like that about certain things but again going back to managing expectations so we were at a dinner the other night with 200 plus people and it was a small room and they was, packed us in like sardines I walked into that room and I thought how are all these people going to fit I thought it was so this tight. must be part of the ballroom and I'm not seeing all of it because it was very it was small. tight but the the at the end of the day, we only have so much, so many square feet, or what do they call it here? Square meters? They, they do meters, yeah. Yeah, so... Well, I mean, I had, I had my Tyrannosaurus Rex arms to cut my meat. Cause and you had like, someone on the right and the left yeah, on a long so table. I was, I was at the end, and then the person next to me, something happened, they couldn't come, so I was able to move that place setting, and we had a little bit more room, but, you know, you're not sitting there the whole night. I mean, we were there for dinner. It was a long dinner. It was a long dinner. But you just make the best of it. But that is one area where every time I always say in events, the worst part of planning an event is the seating chart. It is. And there's nothing worse than when you get the list and they think, oh, it's fine. We're going to put 12 people with a charger at a 72-inch round. 
It doesn't work like that. And you can't I always do say that. these people are going to be very uncomfortable you and it's very close and they want to add a 13th person. And I say it's even more uncomfortable. Can't do that. If you have a charger, all the silverware is underneath the lip of the charger. We're not talking so, about a phone charger. We're, yeah, talking, we're talking about, about charger, charger plate. plates. Just to be clear, okay. because one time a groom's like, why do we need charger stations at our wedding? I'm like, I don't give a shit about people charging your phone. We got professional photo video. I care about charger plates because it's going to look really pretty for your eight-course Italian dinner. That's right. So that's why that matters. So if you're a perfectionist and you're losing sleep over it, consider pot. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Melatonin. Man, I used to be so crazy about... <laughs> An event that I would lay in bed the night before an event and I would literally have to walk through every space and I would walk through the front door or the front entrance and I would have to plan out every thing in my head to make sure that we had it all taken care of and then if I miss something then I would have to start back at the beginning mentally walk in make sure that I had checked all the boxes knowing that I had remembered something put that on my list then I could walk into the next space and then I had to literally go through the whole thing and then and I would drive myself crazy. Mm -hmm. It would be an all night ordeal and I wouldn't be able to sleep. Right. I, I used to do that, but then I think very early on in my career, so many crazy things happened. Like unexpected things that are not on the timeline. So I just gave up. I'm like, you know what? We The timeline is built. We've done the best that we could with all the information that we have today. Yeah, but I'm talking more like the design elements yeah. though, because the design elements for me were, it was, I had to make sure, okay, I've ordered this, these flowers for this space and these flowers for this space. Oh, and we're going to have this installation here and I need to make sure that we have the right base and there's enough candles or whatever it is. And, oh, how am I doing the centerpieces? And, and mentally, I know, it, I know that I can set it up. Mm-hmm. And it's going to, and I think in my brain, like I've really thought about how it's going to look. And it usually pretty much always yeah. is executed in my brain. But the thing is, is that I have it in my brain and I can't translate it to anyone else unless we were to actually replicate it or set it up before the actual event. So that's the hard part. So that's one of the reasons we do sample tables for every sample bouquet. Sample tables is because a lot of times I'm not there. In fact, I think my team has been pretty boisterous that it's easier if I'm not at an event on the weekend, but that's how events should be when, when they're planned and you've got the right team and the right people and everybody does a hundred percent, then the weekend or whatever day or days the events happen, that's the easy part. The, the execution piece should really be the easy part, but you've got to have somebody who is in charge and someone who can manage unexpected situations and deal with pressure really well. And that's not easy to teach. You either are kind of born with it or you're not, like survival skills. After going through so many things that just come up, it's like, okay, shit's gonna happen. We just have to roll with it and stay positive and learn from it. Do the best that you can. At the end of the day, as long as you gave your best, quit beating yourself up and if you're a perfectionist, which I feel like a lot of people are in our industry. You just have to realize if you strive for perfection, you set yourself up for failure and nothing will ever be perfect. And that's what I realized. And so the thing is, and I always tell all of my couples whenever anyone's getting married, I say, no one has any idea what is what we've talked about or what is supposed to happen at your wedding or your event. Yeah. So... If you don't panic and you don't give anyone any indication that something was supposed to happen or something's running five minutes late or there was supposed to be this fork or whatever, and you just enjoy yourself and let us do what we're doing behind the scenes, then we will make it perfect and your guest will have no idea if it's perfect or not because they have no idea anything that was discussed. So that I think is the, the one thing that I learned is that you just have to like, shit happens. Mm -hmm. And if it does, then you realize and you just, you think on your feet, you make it, you, you get it as close and as good as you can. And once that happens, then you're moving on. So if someone wanted to visit where we are in okay. Italy, what can they expect when they come here? So if someone wanted to come to Il Tesoro, I mean, for me, it has become home. And I think that that is the one thing that Rita and her family and everyone that works here really have made that this feels like an extension of your home. And I have sent over the last five years, a, a number of people here to come visit and everyone leaves here feeling like 
Rita has welcomed in, them into her house and really just made them feel like this is their Italian home. And I think that that is probably one of the most important things that I would say you take away from coming to visit Il Tesoro. It is, it is your Italian home, no matter where you are from. You could be from the Middle East, you could be from the United States, you could be from somewhere else in Italy, but you will feel like this is home. People come from all over the world, all over the world. Now, if you're going to come to Italy, Wait. let us know. Wait, let we can see. fill you in on a few tips, um, like plugs and <laughs> birds and currency. Put your shit in a plastic bag if you don't check a bag. And like, there's just all these things. But since Rita couldn't be here, we yes. asked her to yes. send us five things, five takeaways. So, and why I say five is because there's five senses. The five senses are what you feel, what you see, what, what you, you see, taste, what you taste, what you smell. Five the five senses. senses are what you taste, what you smell, what you feel, what you see, and what you hear. Okay. Okay. So for Rita, as the owner of Il Tesoro, we asked her for five things and she said, number one, to feel like you are home away from home which is what I just said. Every time I come here, I feel like this is my home. Number two, that you feel welcome and that you are a long lasting member of their family. So home is where your family is. So that kind of ties in. Three, it's a little island where you can feel everything is okay and you can relax. And it is, it's very tranquil. It is quiet. quiet. It's relaxing. in the middle of kind of the Italian or the Tuscan countryside. And it is very relaxing. Um, that you get the true authentic Italian experience. And do you feel like you've had that since you've been here? Absolutely. I will say though, if I had never been to another country or been to Italy or been to Europe before, I might feel a little lost, but this is just stuff that you would want to do research on the front end. If you're going to plan an event, um, to make sure like you understand like about the plugs and what you can plug in and what you can't plug in. Like for example, the very first time, I went to Italy, I had a curling iron with the plug that you need, like the, no, the plug. I didn't have a converter. You didn't have the adapter. The adapter for the converter. And it like literally just like blew up my, I mean, it started to But smell. how did it even, how did you even plug it in? It was because the voltage, no, no I no, plugged I, it in. Yeah, but most, our plugs in the U.S. don't even fit in theirs. Oh, no, 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 no. I had a, um, I had the thing, oh, yeah, that you, the two prong, uh, and then I plugged in the curling iron. But my curling iron is only for U.S. It's, it wasn't really for... Um, I think curling iron and blow dryers are the things that people it always is. have problems it with. It is. It's, it's something with like heat and voltage. So it's like, I never take my, I, I don't take certain things places now, but it's like understanding like where the lights are. And instead of turning them on, that means off. <laughs> like little things like that. That's why we can never have nice things. Um, and number five, just to wrap up the five things that you, as a visitor to El Tesoro, will experience is number five, <laughs> drum roll, uh, feel like you are finding someone who cares about you with absolute discretion. I think everyone should come here and visit because it's a pretty magical place. It is. It's so beautiful. And... We're here at a time where it's not, what, spring? Well, spring has not sprung, and I mean, the weather has been really cold today. Literally today, it would start raining. Then the, the sun, sun came out. out. <laughs> then it would start to hail. Then for a little bit, of, then it snowed. All important. Then it would literally <laughs> start to rain so hard again. I will say, It was say, very though, strange, but we did get our TikTok done outside, so. We did, under the sun. And under the Tuscan sun. Yes. With this beautiful rock arch that you designed. I did. And that's another thing too, like for venue owners and hotels and resorts, like when you bring a bunch of experts in hospitality to your place, we tell you the truth. We I never understand why when they design a hotel, they never ask someone that does events that's going to be executing events in their ballroom what they should do but that does not seem to be an idea that designers have or... and a load in and a load out and where's the service elevator and where are people going to park I, i'm just saying, and how can we make the carpet not hideous how are we like in the times that we're in and that people are investing so much into properties and hotels and investments and then that's just one little detail where, where they forget to hire a consultant who actually knows well, I, what they're doing. We did an event a few months ago and literally the loading dock yeah. 
from the ballroom always a problem. was a hallway that was probably this far. But the venue had all their tables stored down the entire runway to the ballroom. So we had to carry everything in through the steps and down the steps. It was... Uh, no. It was ridiculous. No. I would never no. work there again. One of enough. the last events that we did, and it's a new hotel in Nashville. Now, like, we ask when we're doing a walkthrough 30-ish days before, like, where is this? It, if it's brand new, how do we know? It's the first time we've done... And many times, we're the first to do anything in new places because I love to learn. But then you find out things like, for example, that your entire ballroom is on one audio channel. And you need a mixer board to have different microphones. And I mean, there's just so many things where it's like, unless it's happened to you and you know to ask those things, you can't go read a textbook and like know these things. Why did we start talking about that? Hotels, resorts. Oh, because you said that I designed the arch. If you work at a venue or a hotel, and you know that they're expanding the brand, my God, please give feedback that if one of their main revenue streams is events, and it's gonna come from food and beverage, and events, not hotel heads and bed sleep rooms, hire the right people. You're gonna save so much time, energy, and effort on the beginning. Everyone's experience, not just the client. Some cities forget that the, the vendors and the creative partners and the people that service the events, those are really your clients. Because if they don't like working there... They're not referring anyone to go back. Uh-uh. And they're all in a bad mood and pissed off that they have to come and load in and load out. So that's why we're very specific in working at specific places, but to also build that relationship with people who actually give a shit. Because it's hard to find those people these days. Now we're like, do you have a pulse? Can you just show up show up with a pulse in, in your hands and um, we'll put you to work? Do you, see, do you keep seeing that um, Instagram post that people are posting? It's like... Everyone is short on labor, so support those that did show up. And I'm like, don't show up if you don't know what you're doing. I mean, there's no reason to... I haven't seen that. Oh, you haven't seen it? No. I mean, it's great that people are showing up for work, but if you haven't trained them properly to know how to do the work, then it's just... I mean, I want to support you, but I also need to support you that you know what you're doing. Exactly. It matters. Follow us on TikTok. We don't always put them over on Instagram Reels. TikTok's a little bit more not so perfect, which is why I love it. Tell them your Instagram and TikTok handle. I have no idea what my TikTok is. I think we made it the same as your Instagram, didn't we? Really? Let me see. <laughs> the amount of people that set up TikTok accounts when I'm with them is so much fun. No, you didn't, did you? No, I think you had one. You oh, just it's Brian C. Worley. It. Okay, Brian. So C. my TikTok is Brian C. Worley. I have one. And he has one video. One video. And I'm following more people than are following me. That's okay. <laughs> and my Instagram is B Worley Productions. Yes. So like and follow. So for all of you who asking, who is the boy in your TikTok videos? And some of my TikTok videos. Oh, people are asking? Yeah. Oh. This is Brian. Brian Worley. He's a great dancer, he's so much fun, and he likes me to keep my language clean. Yes. <laughs> now we have to go get his computer and fix it. And clean it up. Yeah, we're gonna clean up his computer, do some offloading of Dropbox, and he needs to free up some space. This was fun. This was fun, thank Did you. Did you have fun? Yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks for watching or listening, and be sure to tune in next week to another episode of Business Unveiled. And be sure next time to GSD. Get That's shit right. done. Oh I did. Bye, y'all. And if you're looking for a host and hostess for your event, we're available. <laughs> to motivate your people to dance, party, and have fun and just live life to the fullest and quit dance, being dance, so dance, uptight. Dance, 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 because life is too short and you really need to enjoy what you're doing. And your time is precious and you can never get it back. So be sure that you're spending it doing the right things that you want to do and spending it with the right people that you want to be around. Peace. Love and happiness. That's it for this week's episode of Business Unveiled. Now that you have all the tools that you need to conquer the world and GSD, get shit done, would you share this with your friends and fellow business leaders? One thing that would really, really help us and help new listeners is for you to rate the show and leave a comment in Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you tune in and listen to Business Unveiled. 
You can check out the show notes at angelaprofit.com slash podcast and link up with us on social media so you can share your biggest insights. And I want to know your aha moments. Until next week, remember the profitable shifts and structures you're creating in your business help you be more present in your life. So get out there and GSD.